riding technique required for ordinary road conditions is, generally speaking, one of smooth and effortless control. Riders sit their machines with hands poised on the handlebars and with saddles and footrests taking the weight. On rough roads, the footrests take most of the weight. On smooth roads, the saddle. Under normal cross-country conditions, this same technique will apply. And leaving the road does not always mean leaving road technique. So long as the surface is fairly even, the normal riding position should be adopted. Though speed, of course, is reduced, but you must keep your eyes open for sudden changes in surface conditions. Even where a path becomes boulder strewn, it is often possible to avoid obstacles and continue seated if you select your path well in advance, and that applies to cart tracks as well. Some cross-country work, however, calls for quite a different riding technique, which is to rise from the saddle and poise on the footrests. By poising on the footrests, the whole weight is transferred to the lowest possible point of the machine. The rider is then able to absorb the shock with his legs and is also able to retain control of his machine. His legs are not rigid, but slightly bent at the knees. His arms are relaxed, yet the handlebars are held firmly. But when he sits on the saddle, he is jolted and bumped with complete discomfort and eventual exhaustion. By standing, the weight is taken easily on the footrests. The body is relaxed, not rigid. Another point about sitting is the loss of control. The machine steers the rider. But when he stands, he can control his machine by using his body to maintain balance. Balance is one of the most important things in riding technique, and this is a very useful exercise for improving it. It is not difficult to acquire balance in the elementary stages of motorcycling, but it can only be improved by practice. It's a good idea to start with tins placed in a straight line and keep your speed as low as possible using only the throttle and never the clutch to control it. When you can do this, you can try an irregular line with obstacles at unequal distances. In this, the rider steers the machine not only with the handlebars, but with the aid of his body as well. Therefore, the body must be relaxed so that it can easily and quickly be moved from side to side and the rider can make his machine take the path he wants. The value of practicing this will be found when a more advanced stage is reached in controlling the skids and lunges of the machine on mud and slippery surfaces. Watch his shoulders and body movements as he urges the machine round the stones. In addition to balance and riding position, throttle control is vital. In fact, it might be called the keystone of cross-country riding. You can see the amount of movement on the twist grip by the indicator that has been fixed. The machine is on slippery ground. The rider is inexperienced. See what happens when he's told to move off. The only part of that performance that was right was the selection of bottom gear. Let's see what he does wrong. Revs his engine up too much and bangs in his clutch. The result is wheel spin and disaster. It's really quite simple to get away smoothly, even on such a slippery surface. Select bottom gear, open the throttle a little, gradually let in the clutch and as it takes up the drive, gently increase the engine power. The result is wheel grip. Throttle control is vital. The rider on the left bangs open his throttle and loses control. The one on the right uses throttle control and gets away perfectly. Level ground is one thing, but a slippery hill is quite another matter. 
This rider is approaching the slippery hill slowly and sedately. He has not enough speed to give the necessary momentum to carry him up, and as soon as he starts to climb, the gradient wins. You can't afford to be too sedate in cross-country work. Let's see him do it again. It is wrong to approach a slippery hill slowly and then accelerate on the slope itself. The approach should be fast enough to carry the machine to the top. Should, on the gradient, wheel spin threaten, the throttle can be eased back to overcome the spin and retain wheel grip, but not sufficient to retard the speed of the machine. But if you should run into a slippery or greasy patch, don't bang open the throttle or you'll get wheel spin. And don't grab the clutch or there'll be nothing to hold your rear wheel. Your slippery climb will come to a sticky end. A failure on a hill usually means a return to the bottom and a fresh start. When you fail on a normal slope, close the throttle and lay the machine gently down on the footrest to hold it. Then, holding the front brake, lift the machine. Release the front brake and the machine will be held by compression. Checking with the front brake, ease the exhaust valve lifter, get the machine at right angles to the hill and leaned into it all the time. Put your foot on the footrest, not on the ground. Apply the front brake and work the handlebars until the machine points downhill. Then, by releasing the front brake and easing the exhaust valve lifter, but under no circumstances touching the clutch lever, allow the machine to descend the hill. He has obeyed the three golden rules. Throttle closed, bottom gear engaged, descent by exhaust valve lifter. It would be a good idea to show you the complete climb, failure and descent, which you've just seen in detail. A fast approach to get a good run up, Close the throttle, lay the machine down. Hold the front brake, raise it, get it at right angles to the hill, place the right foot on the footrest, work the handlebars until the machine is pointing downhill, and descend on the exhaust valve lifter. Remember, the clutch must not be touched during the whole operation. With a steep gradient, the tactics have to be somewhat different from those used on a normal gradient. But first, here are one or two important points. When laying a machine down on a hill, lay it out of line with the hill in a position where it will remain on the footrest and not topple over, like this. It is better, where possible, to lay it down on the left side with the gear change lever uppermost. This is the ideal position for a machine to be pegged on its footrest. Two further points. Before mounting a machine for the descent, be sure you're in bottom gear. And put your right foot on the footrest, not on the ground, or you'll overbalance and roll down the hill instead of riding down. Now let us go through a failure, turn and descent on this steep gradient. When a failure is obvious, close the throttle and peg the machine on the footrest. This holds the machine so that you can walk round and grasp the handlebar to prevent the machine falling over. And with the mudguard stay, pull the machine round using the footrest as a pivot. When it is facing downhill, make sure bottom gear is engaged. Then, with the front brake on, place your foot on the footrest and locking the front wheel into the hill, raise the machine. Now, simultaneously, raise the exhaust lifter, straighten the front wheel and release the brake. The descent is made on the exhaust lifter with the throttle closed. Remember, you're in bottom gear and have the braking power of the engine. That wasn't very difficult, was it? Let's see it once more and watch the points very carefully. 
Fast approach. Throttle close. Lay it on the footrest. Pull it round by the mudguard stay, steadying the machine with the handlebar. Be sure it's in bottom gear. Front brake on, foot on footrest, front brake off, valve lifter up, and down the hill. As in the previous climb, the clutch was not touched, and must never be. Sometimes conditions arise that demand the use of brakes, a bend on a hill, for instance. Don't allow the initial speed to be faster than is necessary for the bend. Once underway, you cannot slow down, but you can control your speed. The weight of both machine and rider is transferred to the front wheel. So the braking power is roughly 75% on the front brake and 25% on the rear. By using the exhaust valve lifter and by careful application of the brakes, the rider can get his machine round the bend without trouble. That's how it should be done. But so often, this is what happens. The rear brake is applied too hard. The wheel is locked and the machine skids round out of control. The same thing can happen when the front brake is applied too hard and the wheel is locked. The rider must feel his brakes and apply them just sufficiently to hold the machine but not so much as to lock the wheels. Remember, the front wheel carries more weight going downhill and with the resulting extra grip you should apply 75% of braking to the front wheel and 25% to the rear. The amount of braking varies with conditions, but on a treacherous surface, use them delicately. Now there are times when brakes are of little use, where the surface is greasy or slimy. The wheels would have no grip at all, and the machine would just skid down out of control. This rider foolishly thought his rear brake would hold, and went down with his wheel locked. Had his front brake been on, he would have had a nasty fall. One of the secrets of descending a steep hill safely is always keep the initial speed of the machine well down and be in bottom gear. Use the exhaust valve lifter and both brakes. But as soon as you feel the speed beginning to increase or the wheel skidding, slew the machine round on its right footrest which will peg it safely on the hill. Keep the left foot on the footrest, you'll need it for the rear brake, and it'll help you to balance the machine. Now the descent. Get in a comfortable position. With the rear brake off and the front brake on, work the handlebars, ease the footrest just out of the ground, and the front wheel will slide down. To get the rear wheel to slide down, release the front brake and apply the rear brake. Here is the principle. When you want the rear wheel to slide, apply the rear brake. When you want the front wheel to slide, apply the front brake. You must control the slides with your footrest. Front brake on, front wheel down. Front brake off, rear on, and rear wheel down. Front brake on, and front wheel down. Keep the footrest dug in, and when nearing the bottom, Get the machine pointing downhill and finish the descent on the exhaust valve lifter. The rider has negotiated a very steep and slippery descent without once losing control. A little run won't do us any harm after those rather concentrated lessons, so we'll have a short trip through the country. Winter time is a grand time for riding, provided it's dry, of course. Just now we're going to find some water to show you how to negotiate shallow and deep crossings. A motorcycle is not an amphibian. It must have solid ground under it. A shallow stream with a firm bed can usually be ridden across. Though shallow streams can be crossed with little danger of the water entering the magneto, say where the high tension cable enters the pickup, it's always better on cross-country riding to have your machine prepared for any type of water splash. The procedure is quite simple. 
Unscrew the cable and apply tape round the cable and the knurled Bakelite screw. This one has a rubber cover over it. Be sure that the cable is well covered and the tape fits closely. When the cable is replaced, screw it firmly into the pickup brush holder. The tape by itself is not sufficient. It must be waterproofed with grease, which should go from the top of the tape and must completely cover the joint where the cable enters the pickup brush holder. And don't forget the back of the cable. The contact breaker cover and breather hole should be protected with grease. As condensation may form, the hole should not be left covered for more than a few hours. Just a little grease over the hole and then turn the cover round until the hole is under the clip. The cover joint is the last operation. Smear the grease all round to make a watertight joint. And now, let's tackle some water. The first thing to do is to inspect the crossing. From the bank, a rider will be able to see what the possibilities are and make up his mind what to do. It's not difficult to judge that this stream is shallow enough for a machine to be ridden across providing the bottom is firm enough. Water must always be taken slowly, so as to cause as little disturbance in it as possible. Taking it fast would create a bow wave, which would drown the engine and put it out of action. Bottom gear is always used, so enter the water gently and feel your way across. You notice how the water is parted to allow the engine through. If the water is deep enough to cover the exhaust, keep the engine running just fast enough to overcome the back pressure in the silencer. But slip the clutch in order not to increase your speed. Remember, always go as slowly as possible, keeping, of course, your balance. Leaving the water, in this case, presents no difficulty with such a good surface. But with mud, acceleration must take place before the rear wheel leaves the stream. Every advantage must be taken of the wheel grip afforded by the stream bed to take you up the slippery bank. The same principle applies to a steep bank. Accelerate to take your machine up the slope, but do it while your rear wheel has the grip given by the river bed. You've already been told about taking a crossing slowly this is what happens when it's taken at speed. Not only is the machine drowned, but the rider is wet. Very wet indeed. This rider doesn't seem to have taken it to heart very much, but then he was only demonstrating this bad technique for your benefit. Riding across streams is quite easy so long as you know how, and you should do by now. What you've seen is all right with shallow streams. But with anything really deep, most machines have to be pushed across. In either event, a rider should inspect the crossing before deciding on his tactics. With a muddy bottom, the water is usually thick, and to find out the depth, firmness of the bottom, and any obstructions, you must wade in. In this stream, depth is the only thing he has to worry about, and as there's a possibility of water entering the carburetor, this must be dealt with. So plug the carburetor intake with rag and see that it fits tightly. Then, as water can also reach the engine via the exhaust pipe, plug the end with another rag. There's only one thing more to do. In order to close both the inlet and exhaust valves, find compression. 
Everything is now ready for the crossing, which is a straightforward manhandling job. The rider takes the machine by the handlebars and saddle, and he just keeps pushing across. Not too difficult, was it? Now, to get the engine going again is quite simple. Take the rags from the exhaust and the carburetor. As the engine has naturally cooled off, the carburetor must be flooded. And this will help to give a quick start. A word of caution. Whether the machine has been pushed or ridden across the stream, water is bound to have entered the brake drums. For a short distance, therefore, lightly apply the brakes, front and rear. The gentle friction should soon dry the drum and brake linings. This is what happened to the man who did not dry his brakes. What you have seen is really the elementary stages of cross-country work. None of it is easy at first, but as you saw, all the hazards can be overcome by training and intelligent handling of the machine. It is this that is particularly needed in advanced riding. And that brings us to some nice, thick, sticky mud. Mud, like every other hazard, has its own technique. Perhaps the best way of learning this is to see how an inexperienced rider tackles the mud and then learn from his mistakes. Slowly and serenely he approaches the muddy stretch. And quickly and surely he gets stuck. The experienced rider knows that thick mud must be taken fast as it offers so much resistance and little wheel grip. Speed helps to cleave a path and keep the machine on a straight course. You notice that he's poised on the footrests, controlling the lunges with his body. So much for thick mud. If liquid mud is tackled in the same fast way, the result is a mud bath. That would have been all right for a comedy film but it's just bad riding in serious motorcycling. Liquid mud demands roughly the same technique as shallow water. The good rider, before he tackles anything, surveys the ground ahead, weighs up the situation, and decides the tactics to adopt. It should be taken slowly in bottom gear, retaining sufficient momentum to get through. You saw the difference? No filthy splashing, but a well-controlled crossing. Now watch him control his machine with his body and note carefully his shoulder movements. Always the hallmark of a good rider. In difficulty, the good rider knows what to do. When power cannot overcome the resistance of mud or ruts are too bad, he drops onto the saddle and uses his feet to assist the machine along. The important points are to use your feet before the machine gets stuck and to keep as much weight on the saddle to give as much wheel grip as possible. Footing, as it is called, is not child's play, and its achievement requires determination and timing. Always try to keep the machine moving forward and get the most out of it. Now we'll try a gully. The tendency is for the front wheel to get out of control and mount the bank. You must try and keep the front wheel in the lowest part of the track where it will be easiest to control and make it go where you want it to. The rear wheel will automatically follow. Speed is a great aid to keeping on a straight but narrow path, but don't go faster than you can control your machine. The last type of hazard deals with a rocky ascent. The good rider, having automatically looked ahead and seen the conditions, approaches slowly, 
poised on the footrest and chooses his path, avoiding the rocks in his way. Sometimes, of course, rocks cannot be avoided, and the inexperienced rider thinks that taking them at an angle will lessen their obstruction, while in practice, the front wheel just slides off and the machine falls on its side. Well, he wouldn't have been if he'd known the correct method. We fixed some sleepers to form a practice step. This hazard must be taken squarely. To avoid damage to tires and wheels, take it as slowly as it will allow. Slow motion enables you to see how the crankcase clears the obstacle because the machine takes it squarely. Here's an even better view, and you'll notice also the rider's legs are relaxed to absorb the shock. The machine takes the shock of the step the rider, in his poised position, retains complete control. Back on the natural climb, you'll see the throttle control as the machine takes the step. This shows you the speed at which a step on a gradient can be taken when a rider is poised on the footrest. There can be little control when a rider sits his machine on rough going. You can see the difference when the rider is poised on the footrests and uses his body to help control the machine. This position is essential on hazardous ground, but when you come to smooth going, drop down on the saddle and relax until the next difficult surface presents itself. These relaxations enable long stretches to be covered without undue fatigue. The army rider's job is to get there, and though footing should be avoided as far as possible, feet should be used lustily when the safety of man or machine is at stake. Cross-country riding must play a vital part in army motorcycling. And every one of the hazards you have seen, and the type of country you're looking at now, may be met under active service conditions. Gradients, rough going, water, mud, everything that is found off the road has at some time to be negotiated. For these, the trained and intelligent rider has no fear. You have seen how hazards can be conquered, so long as you know the proper way of tackling them. To go blindly at them without thought or knowledge is asking for trouble. To approach each obstacle, sure of yourself and your machine, is to overcome them. The principles of cross-country riding are briefly look ahead and quickly appreciate the hazard. Decide the tactics you will employ and carry out your decision with confidence and determination.